Hi friends. Today we're uh, grazing our, or started grazing one of our native warm season grass fields or um, native plantings. There's also some cool seasons in this field. But I'd like to take an opportunity and, and talk to you a little bit about the natives and the benefits that they can bring to your farm. Let's take a walk in the native planting and see what's in there and see how we did it and maybe you can make it work on your, your farm. Kind of as you can tell it's jungle in here, it's the first time we've grazed this field this year. a lot of things growing in here. It's primarily Eastern Gamma Grass. It was established four years ago and last year we interceded it with a lot of other natives. Uh, this here's one of the other natives that we've, we've interceded into the pasture field. It's wild bergamot. It's a great po pollinator. We see a lot of hummingbird moss uh, visiting this plant and a lot of other pollinator insects. Here's the ox eye sunflower that we put in there. Typically that plant's a little bit bigger. I think next year you, if we, whenever we do a video in this field, that those plants will probably be about eight feet tall. We also have cup plant that we interceded into this. The cup plant over here is one. We'll take a look at it. It's great for the birds. The birds do extremely well with the cup plant. This here is a relatively small plant because it's, it's relatively young yet. Well, this plant will get up to about eight foot tall. We'll take a look at an, uh, another native planting and we have some cup plant in. And that field actually had a dry matter, an estimated dry matter yield of 14 and a half tons last year with no fertilizer and no lime. But the cup plant has these little cups in them, has these little cups. And right now we're in a dry part of the season and water's hard for the the birds to find and the birds will come in land on those leaves and drink that water in the morning. You see it quite frequently. Let's see what else we can find. Here's some Canadian goldenrod. A lot of folks don't like goldenrod but as long as the livestock eat it I don't care. Um, at some point we can talk about the forage analysis on some of these plants. We've tested goldenrod at 19 percent crude protein in a growth stage approximately like this. The eastern gamma grass is a little bit difficult to a little bit difficult to establish. I'm looking for the New England aster. We planted New England asters in here too. Last year there's some uh, tick tree foil. Our cool season grasses are starting to slow down because we're coming into the summertime slump. Typically our summer, summertime slump is from the end of July to the first part of September. Our cool season grasses are not growing quite as well as they were. And they're not putting near as many tons of dry matter yield out per acre. Well those plants are recovering and, and growing and getting ready for the the fall whenever there, there is a second largest boost for the cool seasons. We try to graze native warm season. The native plantings 
one of the things that I found one of the things that I found with the natives is they're adapted to our climate and our soil so they don't require the inputs that our cool season grasses that we've brought in from Europe and all over the world that are not adapted to our soils they don't they do well they do well without those inputs so once you get get through your so once you get through your establishment phase with your natives they're relatively low input crops and one of the best things about the natives are that once you plant them and get them established they're there this stand as long as I manage it correctly will never ever need reestablished so you should consider the native plantings as far as warm seasons we have big blue stem we have coastal panic grass we have switch grass we have Indian grass um, those are pretty much all the native warm seasons that we have established on the farm and we're in the process of trying to intermix the warm season grasses with the cool seasons and we're trying to put the forbs and legumes in with those plantings one of the great things by putting those native uh, other plants in there every time you graze it there's a different species that's actually growing it's their time of year and they're revved up and growing so it actually gives you more tonnage I know.
Come on, girls. See, we left a lot of a lot of cover for the soil. We need to protect that soil and help keep from, especially this time of year, we need to worry about uh, evaporation out of the soil, so the soil gets too dry where the plants can't grow anymore. We left left a lot of solar panels here. If I leave a little extra leaves on this, by doing so, I don't have to rely on the carbohydrates on the plant. The plant can actually continue to grow. And you know, I, you need to look at these as your solar panels and that's what your you know, livestock need. And your microbes, when, you, when you're like us, we, uh, we try to manage the farm as a whole system. We take a whole systems approach to it and the whole systems approach, we, we look at, you know, the, the, the plants, the soil, and the animals that are on that. And most cases, by doing so, it's a whole lot easier to manage the land and have more productivity, and it costs you a whole lot less. And for me, it's, it's time savings. Time savings is huge. There's only so many hours in a day. Uh, this farm is run by me. My kids help occasionally, but you know they they're not quite big enough. And my wife, she has her her own thing that she needs to get done. So basically, this farm is run and managed by one person. It's uh, my pastures here on this farm are 130 acres. I have a rental farm down the road, which is another 15 acres. So that's 145 acres of pasture land, plus I have an, a, an additional 70 acres of forest that needs managed. And we're going to go in the forest or the woodlot here at some point and, and look at the management there also. An absolutely gorgeous stand of grass. There's a ton of dry matter here. I'm, I wouldn't even begin to guess what the dry matter yield actually would be. We have another stand that we'll probably do a video on later on. It's uh, a more diverse stand of natives. And last year we did dry matter yield testing on it and it tested at almost 14 and a half tons without any fertilizer or lime. Um, I believe, here's some switchgrass. I believe that uh, the native plants are underutilized because they're native to our, or they're adapted to our soils. So they're able to be very, very productive without the inputs such as lime and fertilizer. This field here has not had any lime or fertilizer other than the cow manure that we've uh, put on there from the cows grazing it. Cows are starting to settle down a little bit. The babies are starting to find their moms. This is something I think a lot of folks should uh, take a deeper look into. It takes a little bit more work to get it established. Uh, like the eastern gamma grass, you have to stratify it or dormant seed it. 
uh, plant it with typically it's planted with a corn planter this particular stand here we planted it at 16 pounds to, of eastern grandma grass seed to the acre we stratified the seed and we planted it on 15 inch row spacings And also, if you have any comments or any questions, please put them in the box below. I will get back to you as soon as I possibly can. We're going to try and do weekly videos. We're going to try and post these on every Sunday. So please, if you see something on the farm that you'd like to see, let us know. I'd be happy to try and get a video. We're all about time management, managing our pastures, trying to get the most out of our acreage. So please don't hesitate to comment below.